Well, I, I'd like to ask this a funny William question Hurlburt. here, and I, I don't do this in a spirit. Could you, could you identify yourself as uh, well? Please? Pardon me? You, uh, oh, I'm Bill Hurlbut from Stanford. Um, Professor Dawkins mentioned that, that he did not respond to the stimulation. This was the out-of-body experience stimulation. Is that what you're referring to? Pittman study, is that what you well, said? Michael testing of what... Um, oh, first here. And, and that evokes the out-of-body experience in some people? It's supposed to mimic the effects on temporal lobe epilepsy and in about 80% of subjects. It's supposed to mimic the effects of, of, of temporal lobe epilepsy yeah. and in about 80% of subjects they get mystical or religious experiences depending upon the particular religion in which they've been brought up. So if they're Catholics they see, they see Virgin Marys and... Tom. Uh, and... Um, and if they're if they're Muslims, they see I don't know what and and, and so on. Um, I saw I saw nothing um, and felt nothing. There was a control which was a vicar who was done at the same time. This was for television, and the vicar claimed to see nothing, but his EEG pattern um, was an absolute champion subject. I mean, as far as Persinger was concerned, looking at his EEG, this vicar was a total. Um, susceptible subject and what Persinger described was that the the vicar began by showing all the symptoms of, uh, of getting the mystical experience and then suddenly his EEG weight uh, started filling up with all sorts of extraneous noise and Persinger's um, interpretation is that he was afraid of getting mystical experiences and so he was doing something like reciting multiplication tables or doing something to to try to uh, distract himself. himself. Well, I, I, apart from the vicar, <laughs> and here I ask this in a spirit of inquiry, not, not challenge, but I, and this is a very personal question, but have you experienced mescaline or laughing gas? Have, maybe you don't respond to these. Uh, to my regret, no. <laughs> okay, here, here's my real question then. And, by the way, as a side comment, it strikes me that the uh, out-of-body experience could very well involve some interaction with the mirror neuron systems, I Absolutely. imaging yourself externally and feeling both identity and the external. Yes, sense. I think you're right on, right on the target. There. And it also strikes me that the whole notion of a personal God, uh, we may be trivializing what we're talking about here because children, young children, tend to personalize the world around them. and. Um, and we, we may see things through our mirror neurons in a sense that, that uh, I, I don't know how to explain this, it's a rather abstract thought, but I think Rama knows what I'm talking about. That, that children see person a lot more than adults do in the world. Uh, you, you can elaborate on that in a minute, but let me ask you this question, which is really what I started with. So, so you have a, an expression, a pathological expression of a manifestation of a religious experience, and you, you use the, the rather pejorative word confabulation because you, you're assuming it doesn't have any, any kind of transcendent correlate. I said it's one, one of many possibilities. Yes. Okay, and I, and I know you're not hostile to these notions, but what does strike me as another possibility is that there's a variation in the way the human brain is constructed, and that you might, if you looked, inquired, and I'm asking you if you have inquired and know anything about this, you might find a equivalent atheist module, if you will, and I know you didn't say it was a module, but you know what I mean. Yeah. You might find a personal disposition that found the whole notion of, of God very alien, and that might not be normative in society either. In other words, you might fact, find the atheist equivalent of temporal lobe epilepsy. What do you think? Well, in fact, I think that's true because as we earlier heard, you know, majority of people do believe in a, in a personal God, so in fact, there may be a neural circuit predisposition to believe, and the people who are atheists, like many of us here, I, you know, or agnostic or whatever, uh, are in fact mutants. You know, we don't have the, the appropriate theotoxins in the brain, and, and so we, we are deprived in that sense. Now, again, there's no sort of, uh, I'm not debunking what you're saying. I'm saying, you know, this is a variation in the population, uh, and, and maybe there's sound evolutionary reasons for empathy, religious belief, and all of that. And, Neil and maybe some people lack that, and they're called atheists. Neil? If I'm to understand uh, some of the incentive of this effort is to reflect on whether 
uh, one can account, you didn't say this explicitly, but it's deeply implicit in this whole conversation, whether one can account for, uh, um, uh, for example, the belief in a personal God as the sole consequence of activity in the brain rather than as there actually being a personal God that's out there. And uh, getting back to the comment made by the gentleman from the Templeton Foundation. Charles Harper. Yeah. Charles, hi. Hello. Um, I, I think there is, in fact, uh, there are, in fact, tests. You said, is there a shred of scientific evidence that refutes the personal God? I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I think that's the essence of your point. Um, I think there are tests that have been conducted, but they just weren't thought of in the way that you posed the question. For example, most people who would claim a personal God would claim that that God answers prayers. So you can do prayer studies and ask, is what you prayed for under these controlled cir circumstances replied to, uh, responded to in whatever way you had hoped in your prayers? And from my read of prayer studies, they consistently come up negative when they're done in a controlled way. And when people believe they're being re responded to, it's because they've removed the, the, they only remember the hits and not the misses. Uh, but not only that, there's, I think there's an even bigger case here, and it's summarized simply in the images of the pale blue dot. Um, one wouldn't call this a scientific experiment, but it's a scientific sort of plausibility statement. Because as you ascend from the Earth and look at our temporal, spatial, and organizational uh, uh, insignificance in terms of the scale of the cosmos. If you're going to say that the same person who made the cosmos cares about your life on this earth, the bigger we know the cosmos to be, the more of an expression of hubris or ego that that represents. And then you, you end up drifting away from the idea that the person who made the universe cares about your prayers. And so it's a, it's a plausibility argument. It's, I wouldn't call it a scientific experiment, but in science you always have to make a judgment as to what is sensible given the information and what is not. And the bigger is the universe, the less sensible a personal God seems. And I just want to get back to the opening remark that, as you said, most people here would not agree to a personal God even if there was some sensitivity to a God of initial uh, force. Yeah. Well, it's a good point. And in fact, the the uh, most famous example of that experiment of prayer is the one conducted by Francis Galton, who was a cousin of Charles Darwin, who said, well, let's do the simple version of this experiment. Most people in England pray for the king and the queen. You know, God save the king. Long live the king and queen. And then he's found that the average lifespan of the king and queen actually is lower than the general population. So, so he said this obviously disproves the hypothesis. But on the other hand, the counter-argument to that is many people say, well, they were not being sincere when they prayed, when they said God. So it goes on. You know. Scott? Charles has a question. Sorry. Go ahead. Please. No, go ahead. Yeah. Sorry. We'll, we'll, Charles will come up there in a minute. Um, okay. uh, There's one question here. and then Let's just go with Scott's question first, and then perhaps you could respond to Neil's. So everything you say may be right, but... Uh, you seem to leap from the evidence to conclusions about gods and beliefs and consistency, maybe a little too fast. First, m the overwhelming majority of people never have a religious epiphany. Sorry, never have? A religious epiphany. Okay. Second, um, the, the kind of experience, mystical experience, you're describing seems also to work with Buddhist monks and has nothing particularly to do with personal God concepts at all. And third, you are describing a part of the brain. So let's take something like luggage in an airport, OK? Luggage is all over the airport. And you're describing it in one particular part, namely standing in line maybe to put your luggage on the counter and get it. And from there, inferring about what might be the nature of luggage. Well, it's a good question. I mean, I think this is not specifically about religion and God. It's about the whole question of localization of function in the brain. The short answer is I never claimed that there's one little module. That was a misquotation. 
But there are, in biology, specialization is the rule rather than the exception. I mean, people would have said, well, why do pigs give birth to pigs rather than donkeys? And people would say, well, it's a mystery. It's the entire pig that's involved. But in fact, people honed in on the chromosome. And they found it's in the chromosome. And Morgan showed if you zap it, you get mutations in, in Drosophila. Then they said it's not the whole chromosome. It's not histones. It's DNA. They honed in on the DNA. Likewise, I claim that different parts of the brain are specialized for different aspects of cognitive mental capacities. But this doesn't necessarily contradict what you're saying. Charles? Yes, I'll just respond to Neil. Yeah, I've had some experience with these um, prayer studies because it's quite common that I'll, I'll be involved in reviewing them and adv advising our trustees, or before that, Sir John Templeton, on whether to fund prayer studies. So I spent some time looking at them and thought that the that null results were actually well justified by the data. But most of the claims of non-null results were, sp were spuriously argued. Recently, there was this uh, study published at, by a group at Harvard that, that we did fund, and I was very happy that it came out with a null result. Um, now, I think that um, these kind of scientific tests can can persuade people out of what we might call a naive theism, theism being a, a way of going beyond deism, uh, the idea of a personal God. But uh, I can think you most, the microphone closer the most sophisticated people that believe in the idea of a personal God are, expect null results in, in prayer studies for very obvious reasons. I mean, C.S. Lewis wrote a very distinguished essay on precisely this. Martin Gardner, another theist, uh, wrote a very distinguished essay in the wise of a philosoph essay in, the, in his book, the wise of a philosophical scrivener. So it happens that there are large tracts of human experience that are subjective or intersubjective, and they're not formally scientific. Ram and I had a conversation some years ago when we met. That conversation is completely out of the domain of science. I mean, we we might it might be rather difficult to document when we met, what we said, when we met, where we met be rather difficult. I mean, you could, we could do some science on it like a detective would. But fundamentally, a lot of human interaction and, and people that believe in interaction with a divine being, they would say that, that this kind of interaction is not objectifiable. Now, you could say that's a dodge. But this would be actually very well developed within theologies. And those theologies, for centuries as well as in modern thought, would critique the idea of objectifiable um, interactions such as prayer studies might um, document or, or, or uh, falsify the idea that say you could pray money into your bank account or that if you had cancer you could pray yourself into health. So I would stick with this affirmation that, that although there is a culture around science or philosophies around science or elements of scientism uh, that put pressure on such beliefs, and in my own life I would certainly uh, testify to that, there actually is nothing in science itself that tends to compel this necessity uh, of direct conflict between scientific praxis, scientific habituation, scientific method, and religious beliefs. And one would find within religious literature, ancient and modern, precisely these debates very well developed. Uh, yeah, I'd just like to point out that um, you could have made precisely the same, I'm speaking to you, I forgot your name, Charles from Templeton. Um, right here. Uh, 